Hello, I'm Ashlyn Webster. And on behalf of the Duke Energy Economic Development Team, thank you for your time today. A few housekeeping items to keep in mind. This meeting is being recorded. All attendees are muted throughout the presentation. If you have trouble with audio at any point, please exit and restart the webinar or try audio via phone instead of computer or vice versa. We have 53 attendees on today, but their names will not show on your end. And we want this to be a conversation. So we encourage you to ask questions. Please type your questions in the chat box throughout the presentation. If we do not get all questions answered, we will do our best to get back to you after the webinar. With all of that said, I am thrilled to introduce two Duke Energy Economic Development experts to the virtual stage, Alan Jones and Mark Hohenstein. Alan Jones is Director of Business Recruitment for Duke Energy based in Raleigh, North Carolina. He leads the team of five business recruitment managers across the entire service footprint. In addition to his director role, Alan aims to recruit companies in the life science and food and beverage sectors. Mark Cohenstein is the Director of Economic Development for Duke Energy Florida. Mark directs the company's efforts to retain and expand existing commercial and industrial customers, as well as attract new customers to Duke Energy Florida's 35 county service territory. And now I will pass it off to Alan to get us started. Thank you, Ashlyn. Let me, uh, first of all, let me just reiterate what Ashlyn said. Thank you for taking time to uh, listen to a brief presentation, 25 minutes and a little bit of Q&A afterwards. Hopefully we can impart a little bit of our wisdom as how we can be a team player in economic development and, and a resource for you and your clients are looking to expand to the Duke Energy footprint. So we're gonna cover just a little bit about Duke Energy as a company. Uh, talk a little bit about our economic development program. I'll then hand it over to Mark to talk a little bit about Electricity 101 and what we would like to see from an electric utility perspective in an RFI during the site selection phase, and then cover a little bit of our rates and incentives that we have to recruit companies. So when you look at Duke Energy, we're headquartered in Charlotte, North Carolina. We've uh, been around since roughly 1905. Uh, and currently, uh, we cover six states. Um, all of those are regulated except Ohio. If you look at the dark blue area uh, on the map there, you can see uh, the western part of North and South Carolina. That was the original Duke Power uh, Service Territory up until 2005 when we acquired Synergy in the Midwest, which gave us service, ter service territory in Indiana, Ohio, and Northern Kentucky, really the Cincinnati metro area. And then in 2012, we acquired are merged with Progress Energy, uh, which gave us service territory in Eastern, North and South Carolina, as well as a good portion of Florida. The uh, counties in the Carolinas that have the dark blue are just counties that oversect between Duke Energy Progress and Duke Energy Carolinas. They both serve in those particular counties. Uh, we are proud to say that, uh, well, as of just uh, this past month, we were uh, named the Dow Jones Sustainability Index now for 15 years in a row and have been recognized by Site Selection Magazine as the top utility in economic development 15 years in a row. So where is Duke going from a generation mix? Uh, we're certainly moving towards a cleaner energy future as uh, most businesses nowadays have uh, either an investor driven uh, to procure more renewable, cleaner energy, and we are obviously committed to the environment as well. If you look at 2005, you can see our coal generation mix was about 58% and expected in 2030 we'll be down to 16% uh, from a coal generation perspective. This year our CEO came out and, and our executive team uh, with a commitment to be net zero carbon emissions by 2050. When you look at our uh, non-regulated commercial rene renewable business, we've got about 3000 megawatts of sustainable clean energy across 31 states and Puerto Rico. It encompasses everything from solar to wind, as well as energy storage. And uh, this group can sell really to, to anybody on the open wholesale market from electric utilities, uh, municipalities, as well as 
CNI customers uh, across the United States. So just to talk a little bit about our economic development program, uh, we've really got three legs to our program. If you look on the far right, you've got our economic development project managers that encompass across our six states. Uh, they've been doing that uh, since the early days uh, of industrial development. And really, uh, the other two components were driven by really the results of NAFTA in the early 2000s uh, when we were really in Western North and South Carolina. Uh, Duke lost a lot of its industrial customer base uh, in the tobacco, textile, the furniture, uh, furniture businesses. So it was at that time that our executives went to the State Department of Commerce and said, you know, really, we want to help be a, a partner with you in turning around this industrial base. And, you know, what are really some recommendations you could provide to our company to help us be a partner in that? And there were two things that really came out of that, and that was that we need more product. We need more industrial sites. And that formed our site readiness program. And then also we need more prospects. And that really started our business recruitment uh, team in 2004 to, to go out and really recruit and, and build relationships with folks to bring new business to our service territory. And we brought in, you know, roughly last year was about 7 billion in capital investment and 15,000 new jobs across the six states. So when you look at our team, uh, our boss, Stu Heishman, my boss is, is located in Charlotte, North Carolina. We have a director in each state, um, and then they manage a team of economic development project managers, as I said before, that cover all of the counties, and uh, they really focus day in and day out working with the state, regional, and local economic developers uh, to partner and, and do what they can to bring in companies to our, to our service territory. You've got my team, uh, which I mentioned briefly, and then and Catherine Young is in Charlotte and she's our business performance manager and uh, she has our business analyst as well as marketing and communications with uh, Ashland that's on the call today. And then Keith Gabriel uh, manages our site readiness program. So site readiness, this has really been a home run program for us. It really helps uh, work with the local communities to help identify, assess, improve, and increase awareness of industrial sites in our territory. We take a certain number of sites in each year. We typically work with third-party site consultants uh, to come in and, and, and do early due diligence on those sites, uh, really de-risk them, and, and really give the, the local economic development person kind of a, a roadmap in terms of how to take in and the improvements that need to be made on that land to, to get it in a more marketable sense so that we can uh, be ready when clients are looking to locate. Today, we've had about 293 sites since 05, and we've recruited 8.3 billion in capital investment uh, to those sites. About two years ago, we started a new drone pilot program to really work with communities so we could go out and drone them and be able to load them up into their websites or, or be able to put them in our GIS platform and, and send a client so that they could uh, get an early look at these sites during the site selection process. So our business recruitment team, as I mentioned before, it's it's you know really to uh, be a one-stop shop across all six states and be a resource for folks like yourselves when you have clients that are considering a service territory with really the ultimate goal of you know adding electric revenue to our industrial and commercial base as well as creating jobs and capital investments for the communities we serve. So how does this model differ um, from what we did for the first 100 years prior to having business recruitment? As you can see, really, we, we picked up the phone and, and worked with the local and state and regional entities, but it was more really of a reactive model, whereas our business recruitment team is out building relationships with site consultants, corporate real estate folks, real estate uh, folks at end users who are gonna try to do their own site selection themselves and really just be in, involved in the process throughout the whole site selection um, you know, process, which we call more the site elimination process and uh, really be a resource to make sure you have all the information you need about our where, where our electric infrastructure intersects the dirt or buildings per se. So currently we have five folks on our team. Uh, I'm based in Raleigh, North Carolina, and, and as Ashlyn said, I was also recruiting in the food and beverage and life science space, although 
Um, I just turned over food and beverage to Jim MacArthur, as, as we all know with COVID, both life sciences and food and beverage is really blowing up and, and we really need some more in-depth coverage. Margaret is based in uh, Detroit, Michigan, and really focuses on the automotive and uh, battery electric transportation sectors. And then John Fremstead is located in Orlando, and John uh, really has focus around data centers and blockchain, uh, and a little bit uh, following the marijuana industry since we do have medical marijuana uh, in our Florida service territory. Sarah's based on the West Coast because Alan Jones really got tired of flying out to California and uh, really made sense to uh, have somebody that really knows that, that Western U.S. and can kind of get to a lot of cities out West within an hour or two hour flight. And she really works with folks in, in uh, the L.A. market that are industrial that might eventually move east of the Mississippi to build manufacturing capacity as well as helping work in the food and beverage and life science sector as well. So really what our services as a one-stop shop, we can help you and your end users identify sites and buildings, talk to you about our electrical incentives, talk about sustainable solutions, as well as other non-regulated products and services and energy efficiency that, that might be of value during the uh, site selection process. Obviously we're here to, to help and host that client visit and uh, typically we will turn the project over to our economic development project managers and the respective uh, jurisdictions to work with the state, the local, and the regional folks to, uh, to close out the project. So last but not least, this is a, a GIS platform that we uh, bought into about a year and a half ago, and we've really been trying to take our best sites by industry sector, whether that be food and beverage or life sciences, um, and not only looking at really the electrical requirements, but does that community already have some of that cluster uh, in their community? Do they have the right water, wastewater components? And we've really loaded these up into this GIS platform. This is just an example of our best data center sites across our service territory. And we can share this with companies as they begin to look initially. Um, and then we can also put together a custom proposal during the site selection phase of what we believe our top sites are and, and any other incentive information and, and such to, uh, to include for your, your clients' needs. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark Hohenstein to talk about electric grid fundamental. Thank you, Alan. Uh, as Alan mentioned, I'm Mark Hohenstein. I'm Director of Economic Development in our Florida Territory. So I would just like to, uh, first of all, thank you all for uh, uh, joining us today. And I'm going to take a few minutes to give you a short overview of the electric industry and the grid that serves your clients. Here you can see a map of the United States, which identifies those states which are regulated versus deregulated. With the exception of Ohio, all of Duke Energy's utilities are regulated. If you're wondering what regulated versus deregulated means, it depends. Uh, there are exceptions, but in most regulated states, your energy provider is determined by territorial agreement, or there may be some choice for larger energy users. In a deregulated state, you may be able to choose your provider for all or a portion of electric service delivery and generation. There are differences between electric utilities, but you can usually group them into three categories. IOUs, investor-owned utilities, which are owned by investors, shareholders. They're regulated through their public service commissions. Then you have co-ops or cooperatives, um, which are owned and run by their members. Some are regulated through the public service commission, but they're managed by their members and their customers. And then you have publicly owned, which are owned by cities, states, or the federal government. Some, some regulation is, is present, but man, they're managed by their city councils, their board, or maybe even uh, governing, governing authority. Duke is an investor-owned utility, and as an IOU, our rates are approved through the Public Service Commissions in each of our states. There are around 3,300 electric utilities in the U.S., with about 200 of those providing power to the majority of customers. This is the transmission system which connects them, and a sample of the transmission level voltages around the U.S. Next, we thought we might, it might be helpful to walk you through how we deliver power to your client. So Duke is a, is a vertically integrated power provider. That means we own and manage most everything from the generation all the way to the delivery of power. 
If you think about the power company as a manufacturer, you'll see that we source raw materials like the sun, wind, uranium, natural gas, et cetera. We process them in our generation plants, and then we send the final product, electricity, to our customers. As a manufacturer relies on trans a transportation network to distribute their product, we rely on a network of transmission distribution systems and equipment to deliver the energy our customers need. Now, you'll hear me talk about uh, kilovolts or KV. Um, one KV is simply a thousand volts. Later though, I will refer to volts when I uh, talk about the actual service level voltages uh, we offer your clients. So once the power is generated, usually at between 11 to 33 kV, we step up the voltage to our transmission level, system, uh, level voltages through a step up transformer. The higher voltages result in uh, less power loss as we transmit the energy to various markets around the states we serve. Think of this step up stage as the on-ramp to the, the um, interstate. Now the electricity is being transmitted through our transmission system. Duke Energy Transmission System supports voltages ranging from 69 kV to 765 kV. Earlier, I mentioned various markets. What I mean by that is those population centers, industrial parks, business centers, or activity centers where demand exists. These are the load centers of the regions that we serve. Once our, our transmission system reaches these markets, we have substations nearby that step down the voltage to our delivery level voltage of 12.47 kV. And this does vary by utility. Now the power is on the distribution system. This is the system that serves the majority of our customers. These feeders and branch lines, some are overhead, some underground, help us provide power to individual customers. Think of it like the local highways um, which allow the manufacturer to deliver their product. The larger the wire size, the more capacity we can carry on a given distribution line. At this point, we reach the customer site and we'll install a pole mount or maybe a pad mount transformer depending on their load requirements and we'll step down the voltage from 12.47 kV to the customer's desired voltage. For manufacturers, it's usually gonna be 277, 480 volt service uh, there are also needs like 208, uh, 220. I should note that Duke will cover all or a portion of the cost to extend service to your client's facility based upon a revenue formula. This varies by state, but your Duke business recruitment or economic development contact can tell you more. So understanding how much power your client needs will greatly improve the site selection process. Let's say your client thinks they might need about 20 megawatts to operate their facility. Our goal is to help you find the building or site which best meets your client's needs. If we search for sites that can support a 20 megawatt requirement, we will have fewer options to present to you than if, we, if your client were to request eight megawatts. Over time, we've found that clients tend to true up or revise their electric requirements downward as they get deeper into the planning and design of their facility. The more information and certainty we can receive on your client's electric requirements, the better the site we can present to you from a fit and timing perspective. Okay, so what does Duke actually need in order to determine the best site? Here are three main pieces of information we need, and we only require two of the three to estimate rates, determine capacity, or to find a site that can support your client's needs. If the client doesn't have an energy consultant or engineer, they can pull this information from an existing operations electric bills. At the very least, that would allow us to determine the watts per square foot and low profile of their typical operation. You may be asking what is demand, consumption, and load factor? Demand here measured in kilowatts or KW is a measurement of the customer's load connected to the grid at any given time. Utilities typically measure demand over 15, 20, or 30, or even 60 minute intervals. In Florida, we use 30 minute intervals. So let's say your client turns on a 600 kW load for 10 minutes of a 30 minute interval. Then their kW will register as 200 kW demand for the 30 minute period. Basically the demand helps us to size the capacity needed to serve a given customer. Now consumption, consumption is measured in kilowatt hours or KWH. This is the amount of power the customer uses over a given period of time, in this case, an hour. This is the quantity piece of the puzzle. In case it helps, think of the water system. Knowing the KW demand helps us to size the pipe. Knowing the KWH helps us to determine how much water is needed. 
And then you have load factor. Load factor is a ratio of the actual amount of energy a customer used during a given period of time. It's compared to the amount that they would use at their peak. Let's say you have an airplane that has 100 seats, the total 100 seats, but for, for the flight from Charlotte to Orlando, they only fill 90 of those seats, then their load factor would be 90%. Now, what if you don't have any of the three types of information I just mentioned? There are other ways that we can determine your client's needs if we have a little bit more. I'm not going to go into each of these, but using this information, we can come up with a ballpark estimate. Here are a few examples of what we typically receive for a project. So in scenario number one, my client needs 3,000 amps. When we receive this kind of information, uh, we have to ask more questions. For example, what are the, what voltage do they need um, and what are their hours of operation? That could help us get to that number. Scenario number two, my client will need 5 million kWh. Now, my first question here is over what period of time? You know, then we need to determine the kW demand and we can get there with load factor or with the operating hours, as, as I mentioned before. And then the last scenario, my client needs 30 MVA. This could be doable, but in addition to answering the questions from scenario number two, here understanding how the client will ramp up will be a huge help for us to find the best site and best meet their delivery deadlines. Again, all of this will help us identify key sites for your project and how best to serve your client. Now, here you can see an example of our Duke Energy Power RFI card, which will help, which will help you as you start to think about what your client might need for power. Um, and you're going to receive a copy of this in your email um, after the webinar is over. And as you can see here, we talk about the KWH, we go over KW, um, the KW demand, and the voltages that they may require in addition to other questions. Now, sometimes it helps to get a sense for how much electricity something uses. On this slide, you can see various appliances, equipment, and buildings, plus the amount of electricity they consume on an average on average each month. So what drives up electric costs? Well, remember that load factor earlier, a lower load factor is gonna drive up that cost. Uh, think of the appliance, a water heater AC unit uh, that cycles on and off. That reduces the load factor and it increases your bill. I'm going to talk about rates and incentives a little. So we um, we get some information that's comparative on rates from Edison Electric. They produce uh, two seasonal comparisons of rates among investor-owned utilities. Um, the information is based on averages. Uh, so this, this is not for a specific load, but it's the average of all those industrial rates for those utilities. Um, so you can take that into account, but it is not factoring in ED riders um, or typically taxes and fees. Duke's rates are below the national average. And like I said before, rates are regulated through each state's public service commission. Um, and the rates you see in this chart only pertain to investor-owned utilities, but it gives you a sense for um, where our rates stand among the rest of the nation. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about our economic development riders. Um, we have economic development riders in all six states, and these riders will offer your client a discount over a period of time, up to 30% of the bill. Duke proposes special rates and ED tariffs to our Public Service Commission, and then they will approve those and implement them. For example, depending on the project, we have a rider called Rider 58 in Indiana, which provides up to 30% off the entire bill. This is a unique rate, which we're actually trying to duplicate in our other states. All riders, as I mentioned before, um, uh, have to go through the PSC, but they also have to um, be, be completed. The application has to be completed before there's a public announcement. In each state, Duke also has a program um, related to infrastructure. Um, and so uh, we, we would call this an infrastructure credit uh, that allows us to cover a portion, um, if not all, of the cost of your client's infrastructure to serve their facility. Think of it like a credit proportional to your client's electric annual electric costs. Please call on us to walk you through the best rate solution for your client's project. Um, we can help you through that um, and, and guide you through some, some things that your client may be able to take advantage of to save on money. Now I'm going to turn it back to Alan to close us out. Thank you.
Alan, you're on. Sorry about that. Got to got to love COVID and, and the mute button. But uh, no, we just want to thank you for taking time. Um, we just kind of really wanted to hit at a high level. This is the first webinar that we've done. Uh, we didn't want to dive too deep into the uh, you know, electrical information on this particular uh, webinar, uh, but we did want to leave a lot of time for Q and A so that um, you can ask how we can uh, partner. Uh, know that we're a resource here to to answer your questions as you begin to help your clients navigate where the best location is for their the future of their business. So I'm going to turn it over right now to Ashlyn and uh, we can have some Q&A.